welcome to another Artist Opus video. Check them out, turned out really well. Today we are covering how to paint textured wood. I love painting textured stuff. Unsurprisingly, there is plenty of dry brush action in this, but we are also dropping in some knowledge about shades, contrasts. I'm mixing some paint in with my contrast, and we've got a nice spectrum of woods represented. So we've got the pale driftwood slash birch. We've got a, uh, a warm orangey brown, fairly common. And then we've got a much more drab dialed back cool brown, uh, which I'm really, really pleased with. Uh, that's the central one there. There is one mistake in the video about 10 minutes in that I mentioned that drab brown, so I'm going to talk about it and what you can do to make the most of it. I don't, but for reference, that means that um, what I'm talking about there is that because the shield is really drab, you could put something bright next to it and those two would just bounce off each other beautifully. You know, the drab would look more realistic and, you know, dialed back and then whatever, if it was a gem or a glowing jewel or you'd given it bright green eyes like the orangey shield next to it, they would really stand out and look absolutely amazing just because of the comparison between the two when they're right next to each other. So that's what I was talking about there. Right, that is it. Uh, I love doing this one. I love painting texture. If you would like me to paint anything else for future tutorials, please do pop a suggestion below. Give us a like, give us a comment. Please subscribe. It does mean a lot and it pushes us up those rankings um, and makes us more likely to be recommended to other viewers so we can educate more peeps. So without further ado, let's jump in. An interesting thing happened when I was looking for the browns for this. It turns out I just do not own any drab browns. <laughs> I was trying to do it all GW. I've got dried bark twice, uh, but I don't have Steel Legion or anything like that. So I'm going to be popping in a couple of different colors, probably not as good for dry brushing. But they should be absolutely fine. So uh, yeah, as as with any of our two tutorials, if you want to swap paints out and rock on, I'm going to be demonstrating a cool contrasty kind of driftwoody birch brown a very very typical for me warm brown and then we're going to be doing a slightly cooler more dialed back brown and that should give us a really good spectrum got these awesome shields to demonstrate it on so let's rock on i really like base coating with stippling i think it's extremely efficient so i'm just going to take a slightly tired medium which has definitely seen better days i'm going to pop some rhinox hide down on it it is a base paint. It's one of the better behaving ones in terms of it not going too thick. Uh, so I don't feel the need to mix a layer in with this and even over black one coat coverage. Okay, so we've got Doom Ball here on our palette. We've got a little bit of the Rhinox High left over if we did want to mix them in, if we thought it was too much of a harsh transition. The Rhinox is quite a bit stronger though. So if you want something that looks 50, 50, you'll probably need two thirds or three quarters of it to be the Doom Ball. Just got a small here. And gently, we're going to buff this up. That's a nice soft transition because of the inclusion of the previous color. If you want to do this, um, you know, if you want a harsher transition or you don't have as much time, then you don't need to do the previous step. You can go straight to the uh, straight to this gorgeous, gorgeous Doom Ball. I really, really like this color. It's why it features a lot. I think GW's browns are excellent. All about using that texture that's there softly and gently. And you'll probably notice that I, I start and then maybe you think that I'm gonna go back to my palette or something like that. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna just help paint exit the brush with the dampening pad. And I'm gonna keep buffing this up until I'm happy with it. You don't have to go back to the dampening pad. You just can carry on with the model and use patience. When you've got texture this good, you don't have to force it. Straight into our scrag. Again, one of my favorite colors. I'm not gonna mix it in specifically with my previous color because I've got my previous color in the brush. So that kind of negates the, uh, the need to do that for me. Keeping it super gentle now. Now what I'm gonna do on this one is I'm gonna try and make the top of it uh, brighter than the bottom. Just suggest a light source. And I can add one more stage to that or I can swap out brushes for one that doesn't have any of our previous color in, and then it'll be pure scrag brown. So first of all, I use a clean brush before jumping to another color. There we go, that's actually made quite a big difference. Start at the top and I'm gonna softly catch the rest of it. There we go, warm brown, sorted. 
onto a color that I do not use often. I tend to lean towards really warm colors, obviously. It turns out having had a look at <laughs> my selection of brands, but for various reasons, um, you know, it's not all about using the brightest or most saturated color that you've got access to. And in fact, there's some really good reasons to use a more drab color, which I'll cover towards the end of the video. So you've got dried bark. Again, this has got nuts coverage. You're just gonna get one coat coverage pretty much perfectly with these brown base paints. There we go. Proof of how much I use my drab browns. My walnut has never been used. Put it on my palette next to my dryad. I'm gonna use a, a mix again, but as I said with the previous one, you could transition directly if you wished. So we are much less vibrant here. You know, these are more dialed back colors by quite some degree. Scale paints, because of how physically thick they are, I do make sure to use the dampening pad when using them, especially DW paints are a lot closer to ready for series D dry brushing. All right, that's looking really nice actually. That's a lovely color. I've got a little bit of Arabic shadow on my palette there. But I think actually having seen it on the palette, I'm just gonna go for a little bit of Rakar flush and we're gonna keep this dialed back. It's got Rakar flush mixed with a walnut. I've added some more water to my palette prior to uh, hitting record. Uh, it's all about that soft buffing. You know, make the most of those textures. And on this one, I'm just gonna let the model do the talking. So those bits around the eyes here, where it's slightly more raised, the sharp edges, they'll just pick themselves up naturally. You can buff or scribble if you wish. I'm just gonna take, take some pure rack off and then gonna work it into my brush obviously is full of the brown. So that should help dial it back a bit. There we go. Lovely, that looks a lot more drab. It does look pretty realistic. So just for comparison, it probably didn't look that extreme when I was doing them, but obviously there is a world of difference between those two now. I don't recommend anyone base coats with the Wraithbone paint by hand. Just use the spray if you're using it. It's got far better coverage. And now my fourth thin coat, which is double, double the cliche. People wondering why this brush looks weird. It's a Series M2. Just quite like the fat body for base coating sometimes. Okay, let's rock on with the contrast method. Okay, so here we've got some apothecary white. I've shaken it for about two minutes. It's one of the, it's a settler, this one. I do like it, but it is a settler. So take a little bit of it, pop it on our palette. Now, next to this paint, I've actually brought in something that people probably aren't expecting, that's Eshin Grey. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of Eshin Grey in with your pocket, apothecary, right? Just to dial it back a bit. Absolutely nothing wrong with mixing a normal paint in with your contrast. And as normal with contrasts or washes, I'm gonna try and place this fairly specifically. So, you know, it, it's not always just slapping it on. I want the same level everywhere. And if anywhere it pulls too much, I'll pull it away using my big fat brush with its absorbent belly. And if I want to, to have it more heavily in one location, I can also do that by dropping it in there with a brush. Just looking for consistent coverage all over on this one. No specific detailing. There we go. All right. Here I've used Light Earth from AK and I've got Bright Ivory from Monument. You could use any kind of bony color and any off-white. You want a clean one though, when I think of, of birch and driftwood and stuff like that. In my head, it's always very, um, very clean, very pure, and that's part of the the nice, you know, the bonus of putting it on your models. You get something that normally you'd only get from bone. Now, if you were going for like mega coherency, you could of course put a little bit of wraith bone in this. It's there on the palette. It's kind of a rakarthy color, so um, it would work fine for here. But what I'm going to do is actually take a little bit of the super strong ivory, which is undoubtedly going to overpower anything it touches. Work away that excess, test it somewhere first. We do not want any streaking on this. We want a good first buff. I 
and we're just gonna patiently bring this up to where we want it. I don't normally do directional dry brushing, but this, because it is literally wood grain and it's going down, I am tempting to go across it. I don't want to follow this down because I'll end up going, my brush will end up being funneled into the valleys and I want to leave the valleys, uh, the recesses in this model um, untouched. I want them to stay shaded as they are. We're gently just gonna increase the proportion of the ivory in the brush. Always working it in, always spinning it around. And then when I get to a stage where I'm lowering the pressure, that's when I'm okay with doing kind of global buffing. I might actually, you could, could go to white here and see, see how it goes adding the ivory. I can always do a heavier amount of the ivory on the brush and a physically lighter application. But that seems to be pretty good. The difficulty in going to white is you always encourage yourself to, you know, you're, you're leaning a little bit more towards the chance towards getting your model a bit chalky in terms of final finish. And I just want this to look smooth. And the other thing to remember is the surrounding areas haven't been painted yet. If they're painted in a dark color, this is just gonna look brighter as a matter of course. I'll work off the excess once more. Going for the last final dip. Test it somewhere with relevant texture on my palette. I've got this bit that's got some Agrella Nerf on it. There we go. So there's our three woods. If I actually, let's do it this way. If I pop these two next to each other, obviously the brightest thing on there is gonna take a load of the attention, but if I pop those two next to each other, you can really see the differences between them. It literally has ended up looking orange. There isn't any orange on there. There's just an orangey brown. Um, if I were to put a real orange on it, you'd know about it. But uh, yeah, they've worked out really well. So different methods and you can of course mix it up. If you wanted the recesses of these ones to be darker, you know, you could have done a Nuln Oil or a black paint and water wash after your base coat, just to push those back. I can maybe show you that in a second. You can highlight these by adding the, the, the bright ivory bone colors that will desaturate them. That means pulling away the color. Um, so that them being so colorful, that will be knocked back. But uh, absolutely this one, I could see that being a really good viable option. Loads and loads of flexibility. You've got the methods and you know that mixing contrast with paint is wicked. There are so many incredible contrast paints out there. You've got Snake Bite, which is super vibrant and stuff like that. Nothing wrong with mixing paint in them whatsoever. Just uh, do whatever you need to do to achieve the effect that you're going for. We've got our drab shield here. I spoke about the possibility of washing it with some Nuln Oil or something like that. I've actually just grabbed a little bit of Incubi by Darkness. I'm going to dilute this a lot. It's just with water. Okay, and then I'm gonna use this as a wash. Hopefully it's not too extreme. I diluted it quite a long way. Obviously the wetter something is, the more it is gonna to pull towards the recesses and the less it's gonna sit on the raised areas. Make sure I cover everywhere, go to the very edges. Get, you know, left and right. If I've been approaching from this direction, the, the area that isn't here that would like, let's say this is a light, the area that this light would be covering, would be casting in shadow. That's the area that I'm gonna miss. So if there's something like this little ring detail, I'll make sure to hit it from both sides. Okay, now I do have null oil. Obviously as this is, you know, it's already transparent and a shade. We don't have to dilute it nearly as much. Just gonna mix in a little bit of our Incubi mix that we have previously. Remove excess from the brush. And what I'm gonna do here, this is a bit of an experiment. Really, I should probably have done this step prior uh, you know, the moment I put the base coat down. What I'm gonna do is try and make it so our shield is lighter in the middle and darker around the edges. And I can just do this by building up a few slightly darker ones and then come back and exaggerate the stuff in the middle. What I am gonna do also, because it's gonna make stuff look brighter in comparison, is drop some of these stages of wash into those recess details in the middle. Okay, so hopefully you can see that's built up quite nicely. Um, just to show this not on time-lapse so I can talk about it a bit. As ever, the points where you want your uh, paint or wash in this case to be the heaviest, this is a mix of Nuln Oil and I've added in some Incubi, some pure Incubi, not from our wash. You end the strokes where you want the heaviest. So on this, kind of sunbursting it. So I start more centrally and then I'm ending my strokes where it is the heaviest. Because this has got grain, 
it wants the paint to behave in a certain way, you can work with that or against it, you know, it's up to you. So just pulling these from the center, there will be more where I lift off or end my stroke, whether I'm forced to or otherwise. So that'll leave the outsides darker. Now, one of the traits of washes in particular, but painting in general is, if you do loads of thin layers, you build up a smoother surface, a smoother surface is more reflective. So even if what you're using isn't a glossy or a satin finished paint, lots of stages of washes in particular will kind of take you in that direction. If that's not something you want, uh, you can try and do fewer but thicker stages, or you know you can just dry brush over it and they'll stay right in the shadows, that'll largely delete it, or you can even go as far as using a varnish, you know, if it's definitely not something you want. So I'm pretty happy with how that's gone. This is a good way to build up burnt old wood sections, by the way, you can do it with bone too. Had a couple of questions in the recent bone video about this subject. To finish this off, I'm gonna grab a bit of Gobi Brown, already dampen my brush. These are very matte paints, and they also are quite physically thick, so a little bit of extra dilution never goes amiss with the, the scale colors. And carefully concentrating on the middle of this, gonna buff it up a bit, and then when there's less on my brush, again, super carefully, we can work our way further to those edges. Now this will kind of negate a little bit the work we've done, but hopefully it'll negate it on the raised areas and leave it in the recesses. And what we should end up with is just uh, adding some more interest to the middle, but also making what we've done around the edges a little bit more subtle. So any screw ups you've had or issues, this will largely get rid of because eyes just concentrate on the raised areas. Then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take it right up to a brighter color. Always got to be aware of the strength of your paints. I say this a lot, but if you want something to look 50-50, a lot of the time in miniature painting, you do not mix it 50-50. Go for a final one. I'm working this in a lot because I want it to homogenize with my previous colors. There you go, really pleased with that. This is a very useful technique for drawing attention to certain bits of models. So if you really like those orky eyes in the middle of that shield, they are 100% gonna be garnering way more attention now. That wood is almost glowing in that central section. The moment you get towards an almost pure version of your final color, do be really careful that you don't end up going towards it being chalky. So be careful with these stages, go in lightly first, and then at the point at which you're confident it's not gonna make any whoopsies, then you can go a bit heavier. I am really pleased with how that looks. I think that looks fantastic. I will 100% be dropping some dark black wash into those eyes just to give us some really punchy contrast there. Carefully gonna stroke around the edges of this shield just to give them a little bit more definition. That's cool though. That's some high level dry brushing. There we go, they look awesome particularly that one that I've spent more time on. Uh, you know, you can really see that that was worth it. I finished off, that's just Incubi, adding the ivory for some dry brushing and a quick edge highlight. Really has added a lot of detail. And we've got a birchy one. Um, the black backgrounds and surrounds of these are obviously gonna make them look brighter. If you were to do the teeth on these, a really, really bright white, even on this, you know, very pale, the birch one that we've gone for there, that would make it in comparison look, um, look darker or more dull. So you've always got what is in the surrounding area of your model to make the most of it. That warm one, you know, if you wanted to do glowing green eyes or something, that would really work very well. Maybe I should do that. Give me a second. All right, this really is off the cuff. So we've got Lupical Green, which has got really bad coverage for a base coat, but has a nice color and some Warpstone Glow. Now, because of that not fantastic coverage, it's gonna make doing a quick glaze a little bit easier. Now what we wanna bear in mind here is we want kind of even coverage on this. It's the surrounding area of the eyes. So I'm not gonna to go too full on at all. This isn't too bright and then we'll keep our bright details for in the middle there. So I'm just blocking in these eyes with ivory and then what I'm gonna do is allow a little bit of the ivory to hit the surrounding areas lightly, not over the top. And then we're going to go in with that Warpstone Glow, which should get decent coverage over the ivory base. Using the angles to make sure we don't hit the edges. 
Going to grab moot green. I'm just going to patiently fluff this around the area. I'm going to grab a bit of bright yellow green from Monument, work it in. It's quite a wet paint and buff that up carefully here. You're going to get some little fluffy bits. You can just brush them off with another brush. And now to highlight these gems a little, I've just been adding a little bit more of the yellow green, kind of suggesting that these are gems. All important dots. While we're at it, I will use this to dot highlight the inside facing closest edges of the texture on the eyes. Sweet. That was definitely planned. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't, that's worked out well. So there, we now have three even more beautiful shields. Um, I've contrasted that orange hues in the warm wood with the green, that's worked really well. We've got an overall cool one, really like that. Still probably my favorite, the, uh, the cool one here. And then we've got the generic kind of down the middle bony woody one there. You could absolutely take that up to a white if you wanted. And obviously if you were to put um, warm reds or other cool colors next to it or super bright teeth or anything, then you get the contrasting uh, different hues there. Textures like this are beautiful though, and do not be afraid to let the model work with you. You've not, you know, you've got those grains. You're probably, hopefully, a dry brushing fan if you're watching this channel. So work with it, let them work with you, put down those glazes and whatever you do, if you need to pick it up in like an instant, if you've glazed too heavily, like if we knocked the rims of this one down too much when we were doing it, which we did, because I wasn't very delicate, like one quick smush or buff with a dry brush and you picked it all up. So I love paint and textured wood grain. I think it's amazing. You can't specifically choose to do anything anywhere. It's not like you're painting the wood grain yourself with sweeping wooding lines or anything, but you can do a lot of things quite fast that maybe aren't as specifically controlled, but are generally controlled. So like I buffed around the eyes of the piece, that type of thing. Anyway, it's a wicked method. I absolutely love it. I really, really enjoy it. And it only gets easier and more enjoyable on large train. This could be a wooden house with glowing windows or, you know, anything like that. GW makes some absolutely sick Lord of the Rings train, especially that's got amazing wood grain, the kind of Rohan era general stuff. Really, really nice. So. That is it. This video has been requested for a fairly long time. If you want something to be covered on our channel, then let us know below. If you like the video, let us know. If you didn't, let us know and let us know why. Uh, hit subscribe, hit that bell notification to be notified of future content. And we will see you in the next video, which is gonna involve me sculpting hair semi-successfully and doing a little bit more green stuff work and doing some surgery on this guy's thumbs and finger that I realize I've missed and I have to attach now. So it should be a great one. I'll catch you then.